we have uh, two glaring manifestations of the multitude of inequities our country is facing right now in front of us, not just COVID-19's impacts, but obviously the um, ramifications of George Floyd's death in, in Minneapolis. So um, uh, I was um, hoping that we might spend a minute talking about your time in, in sure. Minneapolis and about that city, which has seen obviously um, turmoil and activism around police violence, but also quite a lot of movement around housing justice in the last um, year and more. Um, and um, I wonder if you have some thoughts on how those topics relate um, in the current moment. Well, I mean, so first of all, it's good to be here with you and at least in cyberspace uh, on Zoom. Um, so yeah, I lived in Minneapolis almost 10 years. I, I taught at the University of Minnesota and started the uh, uh, Institute on Race and Poverty there. Um, Minneapolis is actually an interesting city, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, they have a long reputation of being progressives. And if you look at almost on any indicator, they score very high on almost any you know, education, life expectancy, uh, unemployment low, um, uh, home ownership. Uh, but here's the rub. There's a huge gap. There's one of the largest gaps in the country between whites and African Americans. And that's also being replicated in terms of Hmong and Latinos as well, which are also coming uh, to that region in uh, larger numbers. Um, so whatever system they had in place, it apparently worked for whites, but it didn't work for people of color. And uh, Minneapolis is a fairly progressive city. Um, and um, but as I said yesterday on a, on a different call, um, progressives oftentimes don't get race. Um, they think um, all, these, all these issues can be addressed through a strictly economical class perspective, and they cannot. Um, so um, in a sense, uh, even though from my perspective, progressives oftentimes don't have the personal antipathy or retrenchments associated with the right wing or the, conservative season, but they do have a reluctance. They keep, you know, sort of, you say race, they say class. You say race, they say class. Um, and while the two are powerfully interconnected and iterative, they inform each other, they're not the same. Um, and so um, I think what George Floyd and, and, and other deaths in Minneapolis has done is shine the spotlight on that. And in the past, uh, there was always a narrative as to uh, why this person was shot by the police and don't be anti-police and maybe they was resisting arrest or, um, and I think the combination of watching that video uh, for eight minutes and 46 seconds uh, one week and a few days later, earlier, watching Amy Cooper uh, talk about calling 911 and reporting that an African-American man was threatening her uh, and the pandemic itself so that people had time to watch. Uh, people were at home. Uh, I think all these things combined. And um, uh, I think it's taken our country to a, um, a new precipice. It's not clear what we'll do with that, but we're obviously at a different place than we've uh, probably ever been. Um, Minneapolis have gotten some accolades from the housing community in the um, months and year or so before um, George Floyd's death, uh, projects like Mapping Prejudice had received well-deserved accolades for highlighting the history of um, restrictive covenants and the way in which that history interacted with current kind of land use and zoning policies. Um, and I wonder if you think that um, that demonstrates some progress on behalf of Minneapolis's progressives and a willingness to talk about race and whether you think that that bodes well for the future. Are you optimistic about this willingness to talk about race in connection with housing justice? Um, you know, I wouldn't say I'm optimistic or pessimistic. I think that we are at an inflection point. What we do, do with this inflection point matters a lot. Uh, how we lean into it, how, how we get out of it, how we understand it. So yes, I definitely think um, even before there were some always who, was willing, who were willing to talk about race and, and especially in the area of housing, but there was always a resistance as well. I think mm -hmm. much of that resistance has gone away. Um, and 
I think it, the people in Twin Cities and even in the state uh, are much more willing to talk about it. But in, at the end of the day, talking about it is just talking about it. The question is also, what do we do about it? And I, I think um, given how entrenched uh, the inequalities, racial inequalities in terms of housing, in terms of wealth, in terms of policing, um, in terms of jobs, in terms of education is in Minneapolis in the country, you have to be proactive. It's not enough to sort of deal with prejudice or deal with this as interpersonal. Those things matter if someone calls your name or follows you in the store. But even if people are very nice to you and don't call your name, it still doesn't address the deep structural uh, inequality uh, that exists in the United States along the racial lines.